What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. I apologize for the lapse of videos, y'all. I was on a, uh, a business trip out in Denver for the week. Thus, uh, I, I couldn't get any videos out onto the channel. However, guys, for those of you who are asking, right, if I don't put up videos, I always put up a blog post. So the blog post version of all my videos will be up on my website, bigdogsfantasy.com. If you want to get notified via email, if that's ever going to happen again, right, if I don't put up videos and you just want to know if there's a, a, a blog post up there, uh, make sure you sign up for the newsletter, which is on the homepage. Again, bigdogsfantasy.com. I'm going to try to never let y'all down again. I don't want to ever do that to you guys because I know some of you guys are upset. And hopefully I've been helping you win your chip this year. That being said, we got to get back on track. And it is, it is time to look towards week six. Um, if you missed my waiver wire post, that is up on the blog. Um, so you can go check that out again, bigdogsfantasy.com. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. And what we're doing today is trade targets. So normally every, you know, Tuesday is my waiver wire. Thursday is my fan submitted Q and A's for the upcoming week. However, I think I'm going to start doing something a little bit different because I get these, I get, you know, the majority of my questions, actually I would say 95% of my questions are either uh, sit star questions or trade questions. I wanted to uh, talk about a few guys that I think are good trade targets or guys that you should be trading away, right? buy low, sell high, as they are known in the fantasy football industry. So uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a few selections of each, some buy lows, some, some sell high guys, uh, and hopefully that can help out a lot of you guys because some of these guys are involved in a lot of the trade scenarios that you get. And I think I'm going to do this every other week. So let me know how you want me to do the Thursday videos. If you, you know, if you want me to totally nix the Q and A questions and just do trade targets every week, or if you want me to do like bi-weekly, like Q and A one week, trade targets next week, and just do that like on and off. So let me know for the remainder of the season and you know, suggestions that you guys want to see content wise, as always, feel free to drop a comment and let me know. Um, give the video a thumbs up while you're down there and uh, let's just get into it. Okay, so we are going to start off with the buy low candidates. Anytime I do these videos, the lists are pretty much going to be comprised of running backs and wide receivers. I'm not going to do uh, quarterbacks because the position is completely replaceable and you should almost put no stock into trading for a quarterback. If you're trading for a quarterback, you're probably doing fantasy football wrong unless it is a two quarterback league or a super flex league. So do not trade for quarterbacks. I don't care if it's Pat Mahomes. The position is extremely replaceable unless you're in like a 20 or 2014 league. So that being said, it'll be skill players. Sometimes I, I might throw a tight end on this list, um, but at the same time, there's only probably three or four tight ends you'd even think about trading for. And obviously that's, you know, Gronk, Kelsey, Ertz. The other guys are pretty much just middling tier guys who you shouldn't put a lot of stock in because I'm not gonna say they're replaceable, like guys like Evan Ingram and those kind of guys when they're healthy at least, um, but they are not considerably better than guys that you can pick up off the waiver. So I wouldn't suggest trading for a tight end unless it's someone that you're getting for value and it's someone, you know, top of the tier like the guys I mentioned. So we'll start off with a, a wide receiver. And this is someone that I gained a lot of hype on towards the end of the summer because I think he was going undervalued and I still think he is undervalued. And that's Jarvis Landry of the Cleveland Browns. Now, if you have been following my channel over the last few weeks, you obviously know I'm a big fan of Baker Mayfield. And since Baker Mayfield has taken over as the Cleveland Browns starting quarterback, he has attempted 107 passes in those two and a half games. And yes, I know there was an overtime period, but that doesn't count when you're pacing out the 16 game pace. So in two and a half games, you, you pace out those 107 pass attempts to 16 full games, right? Because that's, that's the pace we're going to get for the rest of the season. He is on pace for 693 pass attempts. That would be the second highest pass attempt total in a single season in the history of the NFL. And I know this is just the trend of this year. It seems like passing is at such a premium. It's so, you know, we've been saying for the last few years, like, oh, you know, this is becoming more and more of a passing league and all they do is throw the ball and blah, 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 blah. But this year we are really seeing it come to fruition with how poor these defenses are playing and the amount of pass attempts and the volume. And we saw it, right? Everyone got so running back heavy this year in fantasy. And that was something I preached throughout the summer. And I still think it's incredibly valuable if you have a guy like Gurley or Kamara or Melvin Gordon. But at the same time, I also, I also said like, people are like, oh, should I take wide receivers? I'm like, listen, I'm not telling you not to take wide receivers because a lot of the time, almost... 
you know, I'd almost say like 90% of fantasy football seasons, there are trends going into the year, right? It might be zero RB or zero wide receiver or go running back heavy, or you need a top tight end, whatever the trend is, whatever the popular mainstream trend is, what usually happens is if you zig when everyone else is zagging, you end up doing well. So for instance, this year, right, if you started off your draft with a Michael Thomas and a top receiver, like two top receivers, you're probably looking pretty good right now as opposed to someone who maybe went like Leonard Fournette and Dalvin Cook. And obviously there are running backs who are doing well and wide receivers who are doing poorly. But for the most part, I found that, you know, when you zig, you zag and it works out well. And I'm getting on a total tangent right now, but I'm talking about Jarvis Landry, right? Baker Mayfield's pass attempts are really, really high right now. And obviously the ones who benefits from that are the ones that are catching the passes. Just from a volume standpoint, you don't even need to be efficient at that at that point. Um, and in particular, Jarvis Landry is a guy who is going to benefit. Now with Josh Gordon out, he was clear cut wide receiver one there and the pass, catch, pass catching option here in this Cleveland offense. Now he only has one touchdown on the year. But he has seen double-digit targets in four or five games and in all three games in which Baker has been the quarterback. He has not had less than 11.9 PPR fantasy points in any game yet this year. So he's going to give you a floor of 12 PPR fantasy points week in and week out. And that's extremely valuable, um, you know, because he's someone that you could buy somewhat cheap. Like, I'm not even saying a lot of these guys who are on the buy low list, guys, I don't even necessarily think people are looking to buy them low. But if you could buy them even at cost, they're guys who I project to do better over the course of the rest of the season. So it's not necessarily like, oh, I think someone's going to give you Jarvis Landry for like fucking Buck Allen or Alex Collins or something like that. But the fact of the matter is like these guys have played okay up to this point, but the projection for the rest of the season is much higher than they've been producing at. So you're getting a guy in Jarvis Landry who people probably don't look at as a wide receiver one or probably like a low end wide receiver two right now that has such a steady floor with heavy upside as Baker gets more acquainted into this offense. Um, he's gone over 100 yards already twice this year in five games. He didn't do that a single time in 2017. He holds a 29% target share for the Browns. And what's crazy is that everyone assumed, right, that he would struggle this year because his volume wouldn't be the same volume that he saw in Miami, right? Because, uh, you know, everyone was like, oh, he's not an efficient pass catcher. He needs 160 targets in order to do that. He's currently on pace for 173 targets, guys, which would be a new career high. Uh, Rashard Higgins, arguably their second best wide receiver, just got hurt. He's going to miss multiple weeks, which only helps Landry's volume, floor, and ceiling. Landry, you know, they're using him completely different. His average depth of target, as well as his yards perception, and all these things in terms of passes down the field, he's being used as an actual outside receiver and a deep threat, as opposed to Miami, where he was only used as, a, as an over-the-middle, like, short receiver. Now, he's getting a lot of those looks still, but his targets are much deeper with a much more accurate quarterback in Baker Mayfield. So... You know, I think a lot of these things play well together, um, and his, his matchups over the next month or so are incredible, right? So he gets the Chargers at home, which you would think would be tough, but they haven't been great this year against pass defense. But after the Chargers, he gets the Bucks, the Steelers, the Chiefs, and the Falcons, which are arguably the um, four easiest pass matchups in the NFL right now. So if there's a time to buy Landry, it is right now, even, like I said, if it's at base value. So Jarvis Landry is number one on this list. We'll move to uh, another wide receiver. That's Keenan Allen of the Los Angeles Chargers. Now, again, just like Landry, the touchdowns aren't here yet. And uh, I'm not sure I could tell you when they're going to arrive. Um, but Rivers, Philip Rivers is playing way too good right now for them not to arrive. Now, whoever owns Allen is likely disappointed with his performance up to this point, right? I own Allen in, I think, three of my redraft leagues, and I'm not going to say he's been performing great for me, um, and he's someone that, you know, he's frustrated me, but I understand, you know, the nuances behind fantasy football and what to look at in terms of projecting over the rest of the season. Um, and like Landry, the volume is still there for Keenan Allen. He's on pace to finish between 145 and 150 targets, again, which is easily high-end wide receiver two, wide receiver one numbers year in and year out. He has a team high 27% target share. Um, and, and you're like, okay, so what's changed year over year? Why is he not that elite wide receiver one? Well, what's changed is Melvin's Go Melvin Gordon, right? His success and his usage near the end zone in particular, especially in the receiving game. Now, I want to I want to hit you with this stat right now. Melvin Gordon has seven targets this year, just this year inside the 10-yard line which is far and away leading NFL running backs. Well, actually, I mean, he's not that far and away between McCaffrey and Kamara, but they're also way above the, the pace of normal running back targets in that zone. But but uh, Melvin Gordon still far and away leads all of those guys by at least two or three targets inside the 10. So he has seven targets inside the 10 this year so far. That is through five games, seven targets. Um, 
Last year, Christian McCaffrey was the only running back in the NFL to have more than seven targets inside the 10-yard line. He had eight, which led all NFL running backs. So Melvin Gordon has seven targets inside the 10 through five games. Christian McCaffrey led NFL running backs last year with eight targets inside the 10-yard line the entire season. So what I'm saying is, yes, Melvin Gordon has been incredible, and the usage down there is very, very positive if you are a Gordon owner, but that's going to regress uh, at this rate. There's no way he's going to finish the season with 22 targets or whatever inside the 10-yard line. That would, like, basically lead any pass catcher within the last, like, five years in terms of wide receivers, tight ends, all that stuff. So that is going to regress, and... Um, that's where I think it's going to shift more towards Keenan Allen. And I think that's where we see the touchdown upside start coming into play a little bit more. And also, surprisingly, despite how well Rivers is playing, Keenan Allen actually ranks 75th amongst wide receivers in target quality uh, rating per playerprofiler.com. You know, that is something that you could look at as also somewhere that could start to progress to the mean. I'm not going to say regress to the means anymore because I kind of hate that statement, but uh, it's going to start to get better, right? If, if things are like at the bottom, right? Everything has gone probably as bad as it can be for Keenan Allen up to this point, And he's still providing you with pretty good games and s still seeing a ton of volume. So I see a few reasons as to why um, things can improve over the course of the season. So he would be my number two. Number three is a pretty obvious one. And like I said, with Jarvis Landry, it's not someone that you're not, that you're going to be able to buy low because I hate people that are like, oh, this is like a buy low window. It's like, dude, no one's making fucking ridiculous trades for Alvin Kamara. He's third up on my list for the New Orleans Saints. The reason being is people are going to be panicking after that game on Monday Night Football. And I get it for good reason, right? He absolutely spoiled owners for the first four weeks of the season. He, like, doubled his touch count from last year. He was averaging over 23 touches a game over the first four weeks of the season. He scored six times. Then Mark Ingram returned, and Kamara took a secondary role, right? Ingram outtouched Kamara 18-9 and outsnapped him 36-31. to uh, What I will say is this. There, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about buying Alvin Kamara now that his price is going to be heavily reduced. One, you, you couldn't have expected his his role to not change when Ingram came back. They want to use Ingram as their, their pounder, right? Which can be a good thing for Kamara, but Ingram wasn't particularly great, right? He rushed for 53 yards on 16 carries. Not crazy efficiency, um, but the headline here and the reason that you're probably nervous is that he scored two goal line touchdowns. Uh, which which owners have pretty much become accustomed to see from Kamara, right? They were hoping that he would retain that role once Ingram came back. That wasn't the case on Monday night. But I think we saw a bunch of things that kind of worked against Kamara here. Um, one, you know, they have a bye. This was an interesting point that someone raised on Twitter. They have a bye week in week six, right? And given the workload that Kamara got from weeks one to four, it would make sense to give Ingram a big workload in week five, right? He's coming off his completely fresh legs. Give him a big workload in week five. Let Kamara rest a little bit, and now he has basically a light workload in week five, and then he's got a full week of rest for week six. So it's very, very possible that his light workload was, you know, etched into the game plan for the New Orleans Saints. So that almost gives him two weeks of rest after a, a first month of crazy, crazy high workload. Now, you know, that is a smart move by Sean Payton, but what I did not expect was to see the season low of four targets for Kamara. Now... Uh, you know, Ingram outtouched him, but I don't think, like, l coming away from this game, I'm not like, oh, now Ingram's going to be heavily utilized in the passing game and really take away what Kamara brought to the table, right? He had three targets, Ingram did. He caught two of them. Um, he had a big catch right away on the first drive. It was, like, one of the first or second plays of the game. Um, he had a small catch on the second drive, so he was utilized, like, right away, and then he didn't get another target until the last drive of the game when they were like up by 40. So from basically the beginning of the game all the way to the end of the game, he wasn't really used in the passing game for the Saints. What I will say about Kamara, right, he was still used as their two-minute drill running back, which is good to see. He was still used by the end zone, although Ingram was the one who came away with the numbers and the stats, right? He had a target when they were at the 10-yard line. It was technically the 11-yard line, so he was still used by the end zone in that sense. He also had a goal line carry, which won't come up on the box score because it was taken away by a penalty, but he did get a, a rush from, I think it was like the three or four-yard line. So that's also good to see. They're going to split that work. Um, so the usage, while it might, might not be what it was, you know, weeks one through four, and you shouldn't expect that to be with Ingram coming back, um, will still be fine going forward. He's still going to be utilized at the best parts of the field. Now, the other thing working against him, of course, was the long touch touchdowns from Drew Brees to Traquan Smith, right? Um, now, if those long touchdowns wouldn't happen, it was like a 70-yarder and like a 35 to 40-yarder, 
that's usually the parts of the field, right? These long drives are where Kamara eats in the passing game, right? If you don't have a 70-yard touchdown to Traquan Smith, you're probably getting an 8-play, 9-play, 70-yard drive down the field in which Kamara probably touches the ball three or four times. So those aren't things you're going to see week in and week out. The Redskins defense looks fucking pitiful, which was surprising because they've been pretty good throughout the year so far. Um, so what I will say is, you know, listen, like there was a lot working against Kamara. It, it was just the worst game script and probably part of the game plan to get him less involved than most people would have liked to have seen given what we've seen over the first month. But this is not a huge reason to panic. I still completely believe Kamara is going to be uh, an RB1 going forward. If you can get him low-end RB1 that's that's people are down on or excited. Like I would say Kamara over Kareem Hunt rest of season. I would take Kamara over obviously like Dalvin Cook or Leonard Fournette who are injured. Joe Mixon and, and Alvin Kamara are, is an interesting one for me. It would maybe depend on who your other running backs are in terms of like floor and ceiling and, and that kind of thing. But I, I would still be looking to buy Kamara at like value or buy low if you can. The fourth guy and last guy on this list is John Brown, wide receiver of the Baltimore Ravens. Now this right now is the perfect spot to trade for John Brown coming off his first like dud game of the season where he caught four passes for 58 yards. Now the production wasn't there in the box score, but he got 14 targets on the day. I also want you to look at this tweet from Scott Barrett over at PFF. On the year, the percentage of catchable targets for wide receivers. These are among 28 wide receivers with 35 or more targets. There are 28 of them. John Brown ranks dead last in the percentage of his targets that are catchable. Catchable. And per playerprofiler.com, Brown's catchable target rate is 56.8%. While you look at his teammates, Willie Sneeds is at 70%, Crabtree is at 74%. Obviously, that has to do with the fact that those guys are more possession receivers and the average depth of target for John Brown is a lot longer, which, you know, you'll take a little bit dip in terms of catchable target rate for the more valuable targets in this offense. Now, right now, John Brown leads the NFL in average depth of target at 22.7 yards. That is fucking crazy. And he's second in yards per reception, 20.8 yards per reception. He is third in air yards, in air yard share at 43%. Um, only Julio and DeAndre Hopkins are higher in terms of air yard share for their team. Brown has been seeing a ton of volume, a ton of deep volume from Flacco, who is throwing the ball more often and further than he's ever done in his career. Um, Flacco's NFL ranks among quarterbacks right now per player profiler. Pass attempts, second. Deep ball attempts, third. Air yards, fourth pass attempts distance second his remaining schedule is cake over the next nine games he gets Pitt at home New Orleans at home Cincinnati at home and then um his four games leading up to the playoffs including the first week of the fantasy playoffs are Oakland Atlanta Kansas City Tampa Bay those four weeks are going to be extremely important for you to get into the playoffs and then make your championship game an amazing matchup right there so if you want to be risky and see if he has another down game they play Tennessee this weekend which is not like a great matchup for pass catchers but I think John Brown will be fine so coming off a game in which he saw a lot of volume but he did not put up a lot of production I think this is a chance to buy him low before he picks back up where he was prior to this game so I think John Brown is the fourth and final buy low guy on this list and probably someone you can get for the cheapest value of the guys on this list so those are the four buy low candidates now, if you're looking for more exclusive help from me, now I try to answer everyone's questions on social media, but the audience has gotten pretty big at this point that I can't get back to everyone via Twitter, or Instagram, or YouTube, or whatever. Uh, however, on patreon.com slash BDGE, you can subscribe to me on there, and it's a way to support your favorite creators. Um, I give away my weekly rankings each week. Uh, which will be dropping today at noon. So if you're interested in getting my weekly rankings along with uh, a private live stream where I answer all of your questions, there's also a community on Patreon where people post their sit starts and I and I answer every one of those. So if you're getting, if you want more like exclusive access and, and more like actual personalized help to your team, patreon.com slash BDGE would be the place to go if you want to get it from me. Um, again, guys, like I try to get around to answering all the social questions, but um, since the people that subscribe to me on Patreon obviously value me, I value their questions back. So that is a way to support me. That is a way that you can get any kind of exclusive access to me, uh, along with the live streams, the weekly rankings, master stat sheet, and, and some other things. So uh, check me out, patreon.com slash BDGE. I also want to take a moment to thank today's sponsors for the video. As always, you know it's the boys over at fantasyjocks.com. They are the industry leader as ranked by the FSTA, the Fantasy Sports Trade Association, with the number one league championship equipment, whether it is belts, 
whether it is a ring, whether it is a trophy, whether it is your draft boards, they have everything. They have stuff for fantasy hockey, basketball, baseball. If you're starting up a league, they have the live draft boards. If you need to do your draft soon, um, so check them out, fantasyjocks.com. This this stuff is all very, very, very high quality. It makes your league 100% better. Actually, like probably like 742% better when you're playing for something serious other than bragging rights or money. This is what we play for in the E-Town Get Down League, and uh, I gotta give you guys league updates as well. Maybe within these videos, I will also do league updates. For those of y'all wondering, in the E-Town Get Down League, I am in second place with uh, the second most points scored. So the team is rolling right now. I got my super flex squad is Patrick Mahomes is my QB1, Andrew Luck is QB2. Uh, my wide receivers are where we really fucking hit. Stefan Diggs, Robert Woods, Keenan Allen, Devontae Adams. So I actually originally drafted Mike Evans. I remember when I drafted Mike Evans in like the fourth round, I was like, fuck. And then everyone was like, that was a bad pick. But I thought it was good value there. It turned out to be great value. I ended up flipping Mike Evans and Royce Freeman for Devontae Adams, which I'm happy about now, and Jordan Reed. Because I drafted Greg Olson in like the ninth or tenth round. I knew he was going to get fucking hurt again. Got hurt, and then I was streaming the position. So I flipped those two for Jordan Reed, Devontae Adams. So those are my four wide receivers, Stephon Diggs, Keenan Allen, Devonta Adams, Robert Woods. So the, those are those are absolutely lighting up for me. And then we've had David Johnson, who's been performing pretty well. Man, if I had drafted Todd Gurley over David Johnson there, my team would be absolutely fucking dominating. Um, and then my RB2 is a mix of... I picked up Geo for the weeks Mixon was gone, so he obviously killed it. Um, I have Philip Lindsay, Aaron Jones, Carrion Johnson. So... Aaron, uh, Philip Lindsay is like my more week over week consistent guy if I need to plug someone in. But I'm hoping over the next like month of the season, either Aaron Jones or Karrion Johnson kind of emerges as the RB two that I need in my lineup. Um, so right now, I mean, I'm I, it, it. That's like what I need to do, right? I'm comfortable putting them in as my RB two because I have to. But you'd like to see more consistency in terms of volume. I need like a, I need a goddamn Jamal Williams or a Legarrette Blunt injury in one of those backfields, and then your boy will be rolling. But I'll keep y'all updated on the rest of the leagues in the next video probably. But check out fantasyjocks.com if you need anything for your league. Use promo code TAKE10 or TACO CORP, T-A-C-O-C-O-R-P for 10% off your purchase. Your boy's got your bike. Let's move on to the sell high candidates. And a lot of these ones are gonna be very obvious depending on you know the week that just occurred and their performances. The first one on this list is Demarius Thomas of the Denver Broncos. You know I, was absolute, I absolutely hated him this off season. I was trying to tell y'all not to draft. I don't want to like sound like I'm bragging because there are plenty of guys that I told y'all to draft that aren't doing well. But Demarius Thomas was one of the guys that I kind of easily saw a decline happening in front of our eyes. Now, he's been pretty much straight trash this year, right? If there's a time to sell him, and I believe this will be the only time to sell him all year, it is right now. It is following a game in which he went for 105 receiving yards and a touchdown. 42 of those came on a Hail Mary bomb that was like a ridiculous play in garbage time when they were trailing by like 30 yards. So you take away that catch and he had 63 receiving yards in the game. That is the third time in five games that he has had six, exactly 63 receiving yards. Obviously, he didn't actually have that, but had you not had that Hail Mary bomb, you're looking at three games in which he had 63 receiving yards this year, and uh, that's also a season high for him. The other two games that were not 63 receiving yards, 18 receiving yards and 24 receiving yards, and those two horrible games came against Oakland and Kansas City, two of the worst pass defenses in the NFL this year. You're not going to get better matchups, so you don't even know when to play him if you do have him. So... He started the season with two double-digit target games. His first two games, double-digit targets, right? And you're like, okay, maybe DT is going to be a wide receiver too, just based on volume by default, right? But over their last three games, his target volume have been five, seven, and six. He's still seeing 20% 20, 20 target share in this offense, and that is largely because of the first two games. But even at that, the 20% target share is by far and away the lowest he's had over the last five years in Denver. Um, and for the first time on Sunday, and this is a big takeaway, Cortland Sutton actually outsnapped Demarius Thomas this year, 59 to 47. So it's possibly that we're seeing Cortland Sutton kind of play a bigger role in this offense. And he looks like a more explosive athlete. He looks like a better player, especially in the red zone. They should not be throwing the ball at all to Demarius Thomas in the red zone and, and start looking towards Cortland Sutton's way because he's much more explosive. So I, I truly think the fall off of Demarius Thomas is happening right in front of our eyes. And if you're going to sell him, now is the time to do so. Let's move on to number two. We have a running back, Kenyon Drake. Miami Dolphins coming off of his best game of the year. Now I think is the time to sell him if you can. And again, like Demarius Thomas, might be the only time to sell him. So he rushed for 46 yards on six carries, right? Great yards per carry. But more importantly, he caught seven of 11 targets for 69 yards 
and his score. So it's a great game if you started him, which I actually ended up starting him just by default because he was the only running back I had that wasn't on a buy in one of my leagues. So that worked out, thank God. Other than that, there was no reason for you to have started him, right? I was in a really desperate spot. Because uh, if you look at his previous two weeks, week three, seven touches, seven yards. Week four, four touches, 16 yards. You had no reason to start him in week five, right? And you literally never know what you're going to get out of the Miami backfield. Now, Frank Gore has seen double-digit carries in each of the last two games, while Drake has seen carry totals of five, three, and six over the last three games. Five, three, and six carries for Kenyon Drake. The workhorse down the stretch last year, who was so good, saw five, three, and six carries over their last three games. Now, the involvement in the passing game was great in this last game, but that was an outlier on the year, right? That was the first time he has seen four targets, more than four targets in a game so far. His 11 targets in week five that he just saw nearly matched his entire, entire target total from weeks one to four. So you can look at it and be like, oh, he's getting more involved in the passing game. Or you can realistically look at it and be like, okay, that looked like more of an outlier than what we can expect going forward. Neither running back has a goal line carry yet. But the 10 zone carries have been evenly dispersed between the two. Um, they both have two inside the 10 zone. And Gore has the single target and reception inside the 10 yard line for this team. So he's not getting many scoring opportunities. He's not getting almost any volume in terms of the carries there. And his reception and target total are extremely volatile week over week, which means it is very hard to trust and very hard to put him in your lineup for production week over week. This is a bad offense that you can't rely on with a coach who you can't rely on to give Drake the ball enough to be a consistent fantasy producer. For that reason, I am selling Kenyon Drake as soon as I can this week. Third on this list, and this should be an obvious choice, is Isaiah Crowell, the running back for the New York Jets. And I'll say this with pretty much complete confidence. Rest of season, I would still prefer Bilal Powell over Isaiah Crowell in this Jets backfield if I'm owning a player, especially in any sort of PPR league. Now, Sunday's game was insane, right? Crowell went off and he won you your week basically if you started him he ran for 219 yards on 15 carries that alone boosted crowell into the top eight fantasy running backs on the year which is actually pretty bad if you think he's rb8 after that week if you think about it right they've only played five games and a 219 yard game only gets you to number eight you probably have had some shitty games prior to that when you look back at it yes he's had horrible games prior to that the three weeks leading up to this game his carry and yardage total 12 carries, 35 yards. 16 carries, 34 yards. Last week, prior to this explosion, 4 carries for 0 yards. You are just as likely to get a 0 rushing yard performance out of Crowell as a monster 150 yard performance out of him. Do you want that in your lineup? Probably not, unless you're extremely desperate. Uh, looking at his usage, apart from week 1, when, when the two running backs play the same amount of snaps... Powell has led the backfield in snaps in every other week besides week one when they tied, and he's led the backfield in touches in three of five games, including Sunday when Crowell exploded. Blau Powell still outcarried him 20 to 15. Powell has more carries on the year as well as being more involved in the passing game than Crowell. And uh, I don't think the Jets are going to find themselves in many similar game scripts than they did on Sunday. And I think for that reason, Powell will continue to be used more um, because they're going to need him more in the passing game than they will need Crowell in the running game. So I would give him the, the, uh, you know, the edge for the rest of the season. And in that sense, that's the reason why I'm, I'm going to get rid of Crowell after this monster performance. If you could do, if you could sell him for an RB2 price, which, you know, a lot of the time, guys, I know this isn't realistic. Like the, most of these trades would never happen in my league, but I get a ton of trade questions that you'd be surprised about that are just like crazy to me, but it happens. So I want to give you guys these players in case you can sell them. Fourth up on this list, and uh, this might be a little controversial of a pick, but I will say Josh Gordon is a sell-high candidate right now for this reason. 22%, 26%, those two numbers. Those are the snap count percentages of Josh Gordon over the last two weeks with the Patriots. He has played on 18 snaps in weeks four and in weeks five, 18 snaps apiece. I was looking at Yahoo. They have him projected for 16 and a half PPR fantasy points in week six. They have him projected for almost the same amount of PPR fantasy points as snaps as he has played over the last few weeks. And I know you guys that like Gordon are going to hate this, um, but I would be selling him high right now. Now, the reason is this. Again, guys, it's all, it's all, you need to take this in context. I'm not saying I don't think Gordon has crazy upside in this offense if he starts getting a lot of snaps. I don't think that um, his ceiling is any lower than a lot of you guys think, but I think 
just based off of what we saw in last game, right? It was a televised game. Everyone saw the crazy Gordon catch and it was, you know, it was a great catch. That means you could probably sell him for a ridiculous price. If you want to hold on to him, I have no problems with that because the ceiling is there. However, I think you're going to be selling, you're going to be able to sell him at a price that is inconsistent with the usage and what we can project going forward. Uh, someone literally sent me this trade yesterday, telling, tweeted at me and told me that they flipped Josh Gordon for Adam Thielen yesterday. Now, in no way do I think that would be possible in 99% of leagues, but that gives you a baseline of where you can try starting to sell. Now, I would never try with Adam Thielen because that's just a fucking disrespectful trade to even project, but you could start, maybe try selling him for a Keenan Allen. For, I would I would flip Josh Gordon for Jarvis Landry at this point in a second. Um, so that's what I'm saying. It's like the upside is obviously there, but I would flip him for a guy who is definitely more consistent week over week and who you can project to be more heavily involved in their offense. Now, you look at last game, like had, had Gordon not caught that bomb from Brady, I think, what did he have, two targets last week, maybe three? Like say, uh, you know, the defenders maybe pulled his arm down and they got a PI call, and which is great for the team, of course, but it's not great for fantasy stats. Say that happened instead of the touchdown catch, which is just as likely to have happened, right? And I don't want to be biased here, but that, you know, it's just as likely to have happened. Gordon is looking at a terrible, another dud fantasy game with like two fantasy points and 22 or 26% of the team snaps. Coming off that game, you're still really, really not excited about Josh Gordon playing him next week. But because he caught that ball, and of course, you know, that is something that he brings to the table and that might happen, you know, in every other week or something like that. So that's the reason you might not sell him. But if he had not caught that ball, you're looking at a guy who has almost no trade value still and he's still a hypothetical theory guy. So because he caught that ball, I think there is a reason for people to want to buy him right now. They think that it's only going to get better and better. And I do project his snaps to increase over the course of the season, but I think you're also going to be selling, be, being able to sell him at a higher value now than he'll actually end up giving you back in terms of consistency and value over the course of the year. So if you think I'm you think I'm wrong, you might very well be correct and you should fade me. But if you can get something for very good value on Gordon, I think now is the time to trade him off of this last week. So that is going to wrap up the buy low and sell high candidates, guys. And of course, again, all of my stuff is available via blog post on my website. If you want to go check out more exclusive content, uh, patreon.com slash BDGE. Drop a comment down below um, for guys that you are trying to sell high or buy low or some of the trades that you have pulled off so far involving some of these guys. You know, I like to hear from you guys, of course, all the time, as much as I possibly can. While you're down there, I would very much appreciate a thumbs up on the video uh, to let me know that you are enjoying the videos. Let me know what kind of content you want to see going forward. If you're on the podcast, a rating and review would be greatly appreciated. And uh, y'all know I love you and I'll see y'all back on Saturday. So peace.